Welcome to the Productivity Show, a podcast at Asian Efficiency, where we believe that you can get everything done without having to sacrifice your health, family, and things that matter to you. My name is Tan. I'm the founder and CEO of Asian Efficiency, where we help people become more productive at work and in life. And today I'm joined by my co-host, Brooks Duncan, the COO of Asian Efficiency. How are you today, Brooks? Uh, I'm great. Uh, recorded last week with a great guest, and I really enjoyed that, but it's nice to be back on the mic with you as well. Uh, it just doesn't feel right when we go a week without uh, recording one of these. Yeah, I'm excited to do today's episode because we're going to be talking about something that has been in the news quite a bit this year, and that is this whole supply chain issue that everyone is dealing with. And uh, we're probably going to be continuing to deal with this going forward into this new year. And uh, we thought it would be interesting for us to kind of discuss like what's going on, but also how this impacts you and what you can do to address this and, and manage this in the best way possible and, and also in the most productive way possible. So if you've experienced, you know, prices going up, packages being delayed, stuff that you want to buy is backlogged by but months or is even out of stock. I think you've experienced this whole global supply chain issue. And uh, we have some tips and uh, strategies that can help you address some of these things here. So whether you're you know, a business owner, an employee, an academic, or even retired, we'll go over how some of these things might be impacting you and what you can do about it moving forward so that you can have a happy and productive life. Uh, everything that we will talk about will be uh, found in the show notes. So any recommendations and links and stuff, you can find them at theproductivityshow.com slash 386. And as always, before we kick things off, we like to share some of our favorite productivity resources as of lately. And uh, the first one I want to recommend to you here today is an app called Deliveries. So if you're on the Mac or Windows, this is my favorite app for tracking packages. If you're someone like me who loves meticulously tracking everything that you order, uh, anytime it has like a tracking code, this is the app that I would recommend you check out called Deliveries. Uh, the second one is a shopping assistant. It's, it's actually a browser extension called Karma. So this is available on all major browsers. And uh, what it does is you can kind of create like your own shopping list, but also it will let you know when prices drop for everything that you've added to your shopping list. And also when things become back in stock again. So this is very relevant to today's topic as well. So go check out Karma. And then the third and final recommendation I have for you here today related to supply chain is a book called The Toyota Way. So this is really a book about you know how Toyota built their factories and they have their own system for manufacturing and stuff like that. And so it's not only relevant around supply chain uh, today's topic, but also it, it ties back a lot of productivity principles that we talk about here on the podcast and at Asian Efficiency as well. So I, I think if you're interested in our content, you're going to love this book as well. So again, everything will be found in the show notes. And next week we have an episode all about personal knowledge management. And we have the, the special guests going over it uh, with us. And his name is Nick Milo. So I know you and uh, you and Nick have been talking a lot about this. Any uh, anything you want to give away, Brooks, before we start diving in? Well, one thing I'll say is I teased that this episode was coming with our Productivity Academy community. Uh, and had I known how popular this episode was going to be, I would have scheduled it a lot earlier because I get asked all the time, when's the Nick Milo episode coming out? When's the Nick Milo coming up episode coming out? Well, I'm happy to share that it's coming out next week. Uh, so yeah, we talked all about personal knowledge management linking your thinking, note-taking, a lot of talk about Obsidian, which is his tool of choice. And I've been playing with it as well. Uh, it's a really great conversation. Awesome. Can't wait to hear it myself as well. So uh, let's start talking about supply chain. I know you've probably seen this in the news. You have, I have. So Brooks, what is happening and, and why are we talking about this today? Yeah. Well, one thing Tan and I were talking about when we were planning this episode is that every conversation I have, it feels like, whether I'm talking to friends, family, standing, watching a so kid's soccer game, uh, sitting, watching basketball, something like that. Like anytime the conversation goes on for a little bit, always the, the two words that come up are supply chain. <laughs> it's just such a big topic that a lot of people are talking about it, especially timely uh, for myself where I live in Vancouver. Uh, we recently had a pretty extreme weather event with floods and stuff like that. And all of the highways and train tracks going into our city, which is a fairly major city, uh, were wiped out. So all of a sudden, uh, everybody in, in the city has become a big supply chain expert. So with some of the stuff coming talking about uh, 
that we're going to be talking about today, along with these like big weather events, a lot of us are feeling the uh, feeling the brunt of this supply chain shortage. You know, shopping, manufacturing, everything has become more global over the last few years. I, I don't I don't know if you've ever experienced this, Tan. I certainly have. You know, you're scrolling through Instagram, you're looking at stories or something, an ad comes, you think, oh, that looks pretty good. So you do a few taps, uh, and then. Uh, not too long after the the sweater or the belt or the whatever it is that you ordered is uh, on a ship from coming from Shenzhen or something like that, and then arrives at your home, and we become used to this global uh, this global world that we live in. And when something happens, which we're going to get into all of that today, it really does change the sorts of things that uh, we all have to deal with. So it's it's been a big topic. How about how about for you? Is it? Uh, is this just a Vancouver thing or has this been a topic of conversation for you in your world as well? Yeah, I see it everywhere on the news, obviously. Uh, not that I watch the news, but just scrolling through Facebook. Uh, I saw this like maybe half a year ago. A lot of my friends who have e-commerce businesses, as an example, they'll say that a lot of the stuff that they bought uh, can't you know, arrive on time. They have no inventory. Uh, a lot of business owners I know around town have inventory issues, whether it is liquor to skincare products to food items. Like there's just a lot of issues going around town. So that's kind of like when the smoke was kind of like popping up. And I thought, hmm, uh, that's interesting because here at Asian Efficiency, we don't have inventory. We have everything that's digital. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't necessarily you know, deal with this as much. But when I was talking to other people about this, uh, a lot of people were dealing with this. And so I thought it would be interesting for us to kind of go over, you know, what the impact is, because uh, like you were saying, yes, we are living in a global world. And I, I remember back in the early days, uh, this goes back way, 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 maybe like late 90s, early 2000s. I read a book by, uh, I think his name is Th Thomas Friedman. Um, and he's a New York Times bestselling author, and he wrote a book about globalization. And this is before globalization was actually a thing. So I was learning about macroeconomics. I was like a teenager. You know, this is like way before uh, I actually knew what I was reading about. <laughs> but it was just the idea that everything was like coming together and like borders were kind of like not really a thing anymore. Uh, the whole economic system is really intertwined. And I think when COVID hit, we really saw this kind of like popping up now where um, you know, a lot of manufacturing that happens in the world happens in Asia, particularly in China. And so when COVID hit, a lot of things got shut down, right? C countries, uh, factories, and so on. And that has, then has like a cascading effect on everything else. Because if factories are closed for a month, guess what? There's a whole month delay of everything being produced, created, shipped, and so on. So that's like a really simplified version of what's going on. And because we were staying home, guess what? There was nothing else to do other than watching TV and stuff like that, but also shopping. So a lot of people in the US at least started shopping online more than ever before. And so when factories are shut down, Americans are shopping more online, like this, this you know, six all was like uneven, right? So uh, demand went up, production went down. And so we have this like whole backlog of things now of like, stuff not being created, but also this at the same time, us wanting this stuff as well. And so uh, there's a discrepancy there. And then once things started to open up back up slowly over time, uh, the whole transportation system just got flooded as well. And so because of supply demand issues, uh, to give an example, uh, in the past, uh, and I've talked to a lot of e-commerce owners about this, in the past, if you want to have something shipped from Asia to the U.S. on a on the freight, like on a, one of those you know big ass boats, you had to uh, pay maybe like two thousand dollars to get one of those containers. But now it will cost anywhere between eighteen and twenty five thousand dollars to get the same vessel or the same container shipped now. So that's almost like ten times more than what you used to pay. And guess what? Who's going to pay for it? Well, it's going to be the consumers. You and I are going to be paid paying for this. And so uh, if you have noticed, a lot of things are much more expensive now. Yeah. And even once 
even once the items, let's say they make it from wherever they're coming from to the shores of wherever you live, whether it's North America, Europe, whatever, then we, there's also a trucking shortage way back in TPS 380. We talked about the great resignation that's hitting a lot of different industries and trucking is no different. Less people want to be uh, truckers because of maybe COVID constraints, or they just don't want to deal with the hours or the pressure and because of all these semi-court semiconductor shortages, there's fewer trucks available. So even once the items get to the shore, it's more difficult and again, more like you said, more expensive uh, to move these things around. Uh, and then I was reading this thing and they were saying that a lot of cargo moves around on passenger flights, which I, I actually didn't realize so much cargo aside from shifts and stuff like that. Cause you might think the opportunity, the alternative is why not just, why not just fly it? And that does happen in some cases, uh, but there was a lot of cargo going on passenger flights, but guess what? Due to COVID there is less flights in general, which means again, less capacity for all this traveling around. And it's, it's funny back in college, you were talking about reading Thomas Friedman and stuff like that. Uh, back in college, listeners might not know, I'm a, a, a CPA here in Canada, a chartered professional accountant. And I remember when I was doing my management accounting classes back in the, in the 90s, it was all like really breathless about manufacturing and business processes going just in time and how everything was tied together and you don't really need inventory anymore and you want to like time it so that you know you're 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 using up your last bolts as the next shipment is coming in and stuff like that well guess what it works really great uh, until it doesn't there's there's being efficient there's being streamlined which we talk about a lot and of course we love it's right there in the name Asian efficiency uh, but there's a, a point where you can become a little too efficient efficient and not uh, anti-fragile as, as the book says. So you got to strike that balance. So what has been the impact on you, Brooks? Yeah, it's a combination of, of, like you said, prices and also having to delay. Like I have a friend who owns a restaurant and he posted recently on Facebook saying how uh, a lot of his constraints, like fryer oil, for example, it's not something unless you're in the business, you even think of fryer oil. Uh, it went up 200% in one year. Chicken wings went up 380%. Even to-go boxes, the price went up 400% in a year. So you think about it, if you're running a business, how are you supposed to deal with that and, and keep customers? Uh, I occasionally order stuff through like Kickstarter and that sort of thing. I know Giacomo, who's in the, the TPS and Productivity Academy live, live stream, he and I have ordered some similar items on Kickstarter and Indiegogo and stuff like that. And I've been getting items for, what, for emails for one particular uh, vendor saying that all of their stuff is sitting on boats. <laughs> you know, they, they want to get it to us, but it's literally sitting on boats outside the, uh, the Long Beach Harbor in near Los Angeles. And they just can't, you know, the, the stuff has come from Asia, but they just can't dock. There's such a demand for getting into the, into the harbors that even that is a delay. So it's a combination of just stuff in general and, groceries and that sort of thing going up, uh, but also having to wait for things that we are otherwise used to not having to wait for. One thing I've noticed as I was doing more research throughout this whole process, as I was thinking about, okay, what was the impact on me? What was the impact on you? What's the impact on people that I know personally? And as I was starting to research more and more, I started to notice like everyone's pointing fingers at each other. There's like not one thing, like one bottleneck that's holding everything back. It was, it was, Everyone was saying, well, it's either, you know, the, the shipping delay itself, the prices of, you know, freight going up to not enough labor to manage out all the, the supplies and there's not enough trucks. There's like not enough chips and like there's just a lot of finger pointing going on at this right very moment. And it reminds me of the whole idea of theory of constraints. And if you're not familiar with this idea, and this is something you can apply to your personal life as well, even though it's more common in supply chain, but the theory of constraint, there's a great book called The Goal by Eli Goldrath, I believe is his name. And the basic idea is imagine that uh, you have a running group, okay? You go running with maybe five friends, there's six of you in total, and you all agree that you're going to be 
running together and finishing at, at the same time as well as a whole group. Okay. So you're not going to have like one person all the way up front. You're going to be running together at the, at the same time. Well, guess what? If you want to be running together at the same time, you're going to go as fast as the slowest person, right? So the whole idea of a system is that it's only as strong as its weakest link. And in a running group, you're only as fast as the slowest person of the group because you made a commitment to uh, finish together. And it's just the idea here as well, when it comes to this whole supply chain that's going on right now, it's, it's easy to say in a running group, oh, if we have one person that's really slow and everyone else is really fast, you know, one, we can figure out a way to get the slowest person to run faster so that everything goes faster, right? Or we could say, you know what, we're going to ax this person. <laughs> we're not going to invite that person going forward. And now we have a group that's much faster and we can uh, get our run in, in maybe 30 minutes instead of 60 minutes, right? So like the basic idea is if we can identify the bottleneck, then we can either figure out a way to address that. And once we address that, then everything, the throughput, as they call it, or the output or the production uh, goes up quite a bit. And you can relate this in your personal life as well. Anytime you have a process, what's the weakest link there? And how can we optimize that so that we can get stuff done faster? Right? So this is where the T framework can be really handy in your personal life to kind of diagnose where things are a little bit slow or a little bit off. Or, or if you use a Kanban board and you move stuff from left to right or from right to left, like how can you make sure that stuff is moving faster because maybe there's some process that's not as optimized as it could be that's holding other stuff back, right? Now with this whole supply chain, there's just a lot of things that are holding things back, whether it's prices to not having enough labor and stuff like that. It was just like, there's not one thing that you can focus on that moves stuff forward faster. It's like literally five or six different things going on at the same time and everyone's like pointing fingers at each other. And so th there doesn't seem to be an obvious solution right now. And so the impact on you and I is that we're probably going to be dealing with this for probably at least another year or two. And that's why I think it's so important for us to discuss this, because what can you do about this right now? I think one thing is, well, you have to probably take into account that things are going to be more expensive uh, in the short term. Uh, whether that's quote unquote inflation, where uh, naturally things go up in price, or just we accept the new reality that things are becoming more expensive uh, in the short term until cost management becomes uh, more effective as we figure out the whole supply chain issues going forward, right? So I would say I'm going to postpone a lot of purchases that I would normally purchase in the short term and just wait on them, especially if they're larger purchases moving forward. So for example, I don't need a car right now. Um, but car prices have gone up quite a bit for many reasons, right? But if I uh, can wait on purchasing a car, I will do that because I don't technically need it. And I know it's kind of like inflated right now. So what are some major purchases in your life that you're thinking, hmm, uh, would be nice to have right now, but um, maybe right now is just not the right time because everything is just more expensive right now. So uh, that's something that you want to take into consideration. Also, uh, for example, I... If I know I have to buy something, instead of buying the new stuff, I am now considering buying used stuff. So for example, I'm going through thrift shops a lot more where I'm buying clothing that's either new, still with tags on, but just hasn't you know, been sold or has been worn already. So it's actually used, but it's still in very good condition. So uh, especially if you're dealing with you know, a lot of delays and things are more expensive, well, if you go to a thrift store, you can get you know, garments or clothing for a lower price. You get it immediately. It's very convenient. And uh, there's also zero waste in that sense. So that's good for the environment as well, right? So I think uh, pricing is a big thing. So uh, take into consideration that maybe things are going to be more expensive in the short term. So delay any of the major purchases you might have. And uh, I'm curious to hear from you, Brooks. Is there anything else that has been an impact for you in terms of what's going on? Yeah, well, I was saying to my kids that they're they're just living in such a remarkable time. You know, there's leaving aside COVID and lockdowns and all that sort of stuff, which we certainly never experienced. My wife and I, um, even the the things, even my local grocery store, which I I always walk to. I I don't feel like I've ever experienced a time, except maybe in a big you know snowstorm or something like that, where what I needed wasn't available, uh, at least, you know, in a, it might be out of stock at a store here and there, but just going in and seeing shelves, like, not, uh, nothing, nothing there. It's just not something I've ever really experienced before. So it, it's kind of interesting. It'll be interesting to see the people who are 
growing up at this point, uh, if their mindset around a lot of this stuff is going to be very different because we've always experienced, and especially in the, with the growth of the internet, that essentially whatever you want is available with either uh, going to a local store, phone calls back in the days when we used to make phone calls or uh, ordering online. This concept of things not being available has, at least in North America, we've never really experienced. So it'll be interesting seeing uh, this next generation growing up where that is something they're used to. I, I know I did buy a new car right before all these supply chain challenges. And I decided I wanted to go order a, a trailer hitch because I wanted to be able to put a bike rack on and stuff like that. And because I'm a sucker, I decided I wanted to at least get a quote for getting the official Toyota one versus uh, aftermarket. And they said, yeah, we can do it, but it's going to be a nine month wait because there's uh, because of the semiconductor shortage and there's a chip shortage. And I didn't know you needed chips for a trailer hitch, but with modern cars, apparently you do. Um, so that's the sort of thing that I've been experiencing. So like you said, the buying use, buying um, aftermarket stuff, that sort of thing. That's something we've been doing a lot as well. My, my wife really likes going to thrift stores. So we've been doing that for quite a while, but also now if we want to buy something, we'll check like local buy and sell groups. There's a buy nothing group in my neighborhood uh, that's on Facebook. So we've been giving stuff away there, selling stuff there, and also getting stuff instead of, instead of ordering it new, which we might've done. I actually just, it's my wife's birthday today. And I, well, this is going to sound horrible, but trust me, she really wanted it. Uh, I bought my wife a Dyson vacuum for her birthday, um, which again, I know sounds bad, <laughs> uh, but anyway, I bought it uh, refurbished uh, because it was like you said, cheaper and faster and she's totally happy with it. So that's the sort of thing I might not have thought to do before, but now we're, we're, we're starting to do that. Um, another thing we're, we're starting to do too, trying to do more is shop local. So where we might have ordered something online, now we'll look and see if there's a, like a local artisan that makes something. Uh, this has been really helpful for gifts this year. And even online marketplaces like Etsy, you can actually filter by location and find your local your local sellers and stuff like that uh, online as well, if that's something you want to do. So we've been trying to support more local companies because uh, then at least you don't have to, you don't have to deal with this stuff if it's stuff that's made locally. You know, um, there's actually a really interesting thing I want to share with you. And that is, I, I really admire the fact that you bought a refurbished Dyson for your wife. Uh, one, because she wanted also to, you know, considering the, the situation that we're in in this world right now. But the bigger thing behind that I'm really a big proponent of, which uh, it's kind of hard to sometimes convince people of this, is that I want to make regifting normal, like as much as possible. I think it's so underrated. Uh, and if you're not familiar with this term, regifting simply means that uh, normally, or in most cases, when you buy a gift for someone, you buy it like brand new, right? Like off the shelf almost, and then gift it as a, as a thing to someone. So it's never been quote unquote used or in possession before, but, uh, re-gifting is just the idea that, you know, uh, you give a gift that has been used before. Um, but it could still be brand new with quote unquote tags on it and stuff, but it is not completely new. So something refurbished could be technically uh, re-gifted as well, right? Or you, you received a gift from someone and it's not really for you. And then you decide to package it up and then give it to someone else. Right. And I think that is uh, one, a good thing for the environment, but also two, um, if you're not using it and it's still in great condition, if not brand new condition, like why wouldn't you pass it on to someone who actually can have much more joy out of it? And I think there's some like negative connotation right now around this, but I'm hoping within the next few years that changes, uh, especially as people become more conscious about the environment and, and the planet. But uh, yeah, I wish, you know, regifting was like a normal thing. And I uh, hope that becomes the case uh, because we're just, just so much waste in the world. It's so funny that you say that because I just had this conversation with my wife because, and it is a, it's a hard mental barrier, not hard, but it's a mental barrier that a lot of us have to get through my, myself included. Like for example, for Christmas this year, my niece wanted on her list was a 20 pound weight. And as you know, because of COVID a weights and stuff like that are much more expensive, uh, but B so my wife went and found one, uh, 
found one. I don't even know where she got it, but she found one used or regifted or something somewhere. And uh, I'll admit, my initial reaction is, really, you're going to give your you're going to give your niece you're you're going to give your sister's daughter a, a used weight. Uh, but then I thought about it, and it's like, why not? Right? <laughs> a weight is a weight. Uh, like you said, you're saving the environment in some way. You're contributing to get towards the solution for all this sort of stuff. 20 pound weight is a 20 pound weight. Uh, so there's absolutely no reason why not. It's just this mental model we have that if you love somebody, you need to like spend a lot of money on a, on a shiny new thing, uh, but it's not really the case. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that example up. Okay, I will say there's limits to this as well, right? Like, sure. I don't want to give someone a bottle of wine that is already opened, right? <laughs> that is, you know, something I, I want to avoid, right? But um, if someone gifted me a bottle of wine and it's still, you know, in new condition in that sense, like and if I don't drink for whatever reason, or maybe it's not a particular brand of wine that I like or type of wine, then I have no problem handing that over to someone else as a gift if I show up to a party or something like that, right? Uh, nobody really knows either. But um, even even for something simple like that, uh, there's just a lot of ways we can re-gift. So like bottles of wine, if we show up for a party or even snacks that you have at home that, you know, are not being used anymore. Uh, beers as well, especially since they have a more sensitive expiration date. Uh, I think in your own family, you can do like hand-me-down items as well. Like there's just a lot of things we can get very creative with, especially if a lot of things right now are out of stock, right? So I would say definitely before you order something online or or there's no more inventory of stuff that you want to buy, uh, consider re-gifting. Uh, and I think when you start to look at all the stuff that you own, a lot of us listening to this want to declutter. We want to get rid of stuff. Well, what are some ways we can re-gift some of the things that we have, right? And so another tip that I would have for everyone here is like what I would like to call revive your backlog. So instead of buying new clothes, what if you dig up old clothes in your closet and start to wear them again, especially if it's stuff that you haven't worn in a while? Right. So that's something that I'm doing more of is instead of buying new stuff or new clothing, uh, either go to the thrift store, buy used, or I go through my closet and find stuff or, or stuff that I've put away in bags or like in vacuum uh, packs and say, hey, let's let me try to revive this and actually wear something I haven't worn in a few years. Uh, especially if it's there, I probably loved it at some point. So I might as well uh, wear it again, if, uh, if not. Right. So uh, another thing is instead of uh, buying more food, what if you uh, empty your freezer? I know a lot of us have big freezers and we have a lot of stuff in there, but that maybe we put in there like two, three years ago and that might still be uh, edible. So why wouldn't you just empty your freezer first before you start buying more stuff? Right. Uh, instead of buying new books, I know many of you, and including myself, I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, we have a lot of books that we haven't started yet. So why don't we go through those books first before we start purchasing new ones, especially if we don't even have the time and capacity to read the new stuff, right? So revive your backlog. Look at all the things you already have and start using them uh, or, or initiate uh, getting started with this. I actually did that recently because I have these to read lists. And I, what I did is I went to my bookshelves and my Kindle library and anything that I had bought or have the copy of that I hadn't read yet, I, I bubbled those up to the top of my list for this exact reason. Like, let's just get these things, let's just get these things done before I start buying new stuff. Uh, another thing that you can do is, and this is True, and you you touched on this earlier, but it's especially true if you own a business. Is try to control as much as you can. You know, uh, we've outsourced so much, and usually in a lot of cases, outsourcing and relying on other things and going just in time does make a lot of sense. But like I said, there's a uh, there's a point at which you become really really reliant on other things. And uh, I watched this interesting video recently. Actually, it's kind of like two things at once. Number one, I'm currently speaking of reading. I'm currently listening to the audiobook called The Everything Store, uh, Jeff Bezos and the Age of Amazon. And then I was reading, or I saw the CNBC video the other day called How Amazon Beat Supply Chain Chaos with Ships, Containers, and Planes. And uh, we'll have links to both of those in the in the show notes. But it's basically about how to 
mitigate a lot of the things we've been talking about, Amazon es essentially did whatever they could to control end to end their whole supply chain. So they, uh, Giacomo in the live stream in the TPS Plus and Productivity Academy live stream was talking about how containers are really expensive, like the actual containers themselves and hard to get. So Amazon started building their own, like they got a factory to build their own. They started running their own ships, their own planes. They wanted to eliminate everything as much as they can that they relied on that could that could mess them up essentially now as a business chances are you're not going to be able to create your own supply chain uh, but it's it's a good thing to at least mental exercise to do which is what are the points in my business or it could be in my life as well what are the points where I am um, vulnerable that if something bad was going to happen, it would it would cause me problems, and just see if there's other uh, other ways to get around that. Because uh, sometimes there's, it's good to have a plan B, even if you never need to use it. Uh, it's good to have it there. You know, speaking of plan Bs, one thing I've noticed that has been a major impact on me is that I am coming up more often with plan Bs more than ever before. So to give an example. Um, I tried to order this board game a while back and normally with Amazon, you have like two day shipping. Right. And even then uh, it would be like, I would say 99% accurate that you would have it in two days or less. Right? And sometimes you would have the odd surprise where it comes in the same day or the next day. And you're like, yay, that's awesome. Uh, but now I'm experiencing that oftentimes two day uh, shipping turns into three days, sometimes into a week. And I had the situation where I ordered this board game that I was supposed to play with my friends on Saturday and I ordered it on Wednesday, knowing that, okay, with two-day shipping, it would be here by Friday at the latest. Perfect, right? But now, uh, because I'm aware of all these issues, I've had some shipping delays of like other things that weren't as time sensitive. I said to myself, okay, what happens if this doesn't arrive? What's plan B now? And that kind of thinking is not necessarily natural, um, because I was not thinking like this maybe a year ago, but now I do. And now I'm finding myself to oftentimes have to think about plan B because what if something doesn't arrive on time, right? This also happened to me uh, a few months ago when I ordered a Halloween costume. I uh, admittedly bought the uh, Squid Game outfits. Uh, <laughs> if some of you have watched the show, <laughs> I bought both the red uh, costume and the green tracksuit. So I ordered this also. Now, to be fair, I ordered this like, three and a half weeks ahead of time. Okay. So I thought this was going to be plenty of time, but lo and behold, it came two days late. So now I have this like costume that I can't even use anymore until next year. But even then next year, it might not be cool anymore. So why, you know, I basically have waste essentially, right. Uh, and a tracksuit that I don't even like to wear at home. <laughs> so, uh, but even then when the, the shipment was late, I was now, okay. Uh, you know, it's, literally 24 hours before Halloween, uh, guess what? Guess what's going to happen? The costume store is going to be extremely busy. So I end up going to the costume store very last minute. It took me like uh, probably like 45 minutes to get in line. And I had to wake up early as well to get to the costume store to beat the line, right? So they were going to open up uh, at 10 a.m. And I showed up at 9.30. And even then there was already a line just to get into a costume store to rent costumes. Like that's the madness that we're dealing with right now. And so... I felt myself wasting time, even though I planned for it the right way by ordering it three, three and a half weeks ahead of time, I was still wasting time coming up with a plan B, plan B didn't work. And now, you know, the same thing is now happening with Christmas and New Year's and all this other stuff. So uh, there's a lot more delays. And I, I find that you just have to think about plan B more often. And I would say for the new year going into this, um, if you're making major purchases, you're expecting stuff to arrive, uh, or you, you might think that there might be delays, like you have to start thinking about plan Bs more often now. So start considering making plan A's, which is great, but now also start thinking, about what is going to be plan B if it doesn't arrive? Art in the live stream says you should repurpose the costume for a, as a tracksuit mafia from Hawkeye. I know there's a 0% chance you will get that reference, but I just wanted to acknowledge it, Art, because uh, that's, a, that's a solid, solid, solid idea. <laughs> But, I think that's way before my time. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but you know, I think I think the the general theme we're saying is for, and this is going to be, I think, for all of 2022. I, I really do think this that we're just going to have to be okay uh, 
with waiting for things where we might not have been okay before. Uh, the, we're all used to next day or two day shipping. We've become used to it. Uh, it's probably not going to be as possible for all the time. Like sometimes, sure, but not all the time. Um, I, I always remember this scenario when I was visiting you in Austin one time and we were driving around somewhere and we decided we wanted to play. I can't remember if it was like, I think it was an expansion pack for Carcassonne or maybe it was pandemic or something like that. We were in the car. We decided to, we wanted to play it. So you just whipped out your phone. You use, I don't know if it was like Amazon or some other local service that you're like, I want the game. And they delivered it to the, <laughs> to the place we were going like that within a couple hours. Uh, and that sort of thing is just not going to be as possible uh, as, as we're all getting used to. So uh, I think for 2022, the theme is we're just going to have to be used to A, paying a little more for things, like you said, and B, waiting a little longer for things. Yeah. To wrap up today's episode, uh, I know today's episode was a little bit more conceptual and a lot more like themey, me meaning there's a lot of major themes to take into consideration. But as always, we want to make sure we end it with an actual step that you can take. So my recommendation to you here moving forward is to say, what are some major purchases that you know that you are going to make in 2022? And if you can create a list, I would say plan ahead for them and have a backup plan for when they might not go as planned. So especially if uh, you're moving, for example, furniture is backlogged, right? If you have to buy a car next year or get a new lease, like these are all things you have to take into consideration and start thinking about what is a plan B for that if it doesn't go as planned. And I think if you do that, you'll be well prepared uh, and you'll probably have a lot fewer surprises to deal with than the waste last time as a result. So uh, next week's episode, again, is with Nick Milo. We're going to be talking about personal knowledge management. So if you're an Obsidian fan, you're going to enjoy this episode very much. And uh, like we mentioned before, everything that we discussed today, all the videos, articles, links, you can find them in the show notes by going to theproductivityshow.com slash 386. And uh, thanks again for joining us. And we'll see you next Productive Monday.